Welcome to 2.6. Prove statements about statements. <laughs> statements. <laughs> Probably should start over. No, let's keep on going. Uh, prove statements about segments and angles. Okay, and what does this picture have to do with this? I don't know. I think this is a bridge. This section is a bridge to greater knowledge. If you understand this section, you will be going to new territory over this wonderful bridge. You'll be transiting. Using the transitive property will transit you across this bridge. Is that close enough? Yeah, whatever. Here we go. 2.6. Essential question is how do I write proofs using geometric theorems? And this is a, a bridge section of a mini sorts. I think it's just a excellent. It's, it's difficult to think through these things, but it really is very helpful to uh, understand these concepts. It's also helpful if I have my pencil with me. So thank you for your patience as I ran over and grabbed my pencil. So a proof. What is a proof? We want to learn how to write proofs. So what is a proof? A proof is a logical argument that shows that a statement is true. It's an airtight argument. It is a presentation of facts that are irrefutable, that cannot be torn down. You cannot find a counter example. Okay, so uh, we want to be able to prove that things are true. And one way of doing that, one form of doing that, is to put it into a two column proof that has numbered statements. See on the left here, we have numbered statements on the left hand side and then corresponding reasons on the right hand side. Uh, these are corresponding reasons that show an argument in logical order. So this is our logic. We start here. It's kind of like directions. If you start at one place, if you are at one place, and how do you get to another place? Well, first you do this, and then you turn there, and then you go a mile and a half, and then you turn right at the stop sign, that sort of thing. So these are steps that you take to get from this one statement to your goal, your finish line, uh, the thing that you're trying to uh, prove. But you can't just say those things. You have to have a basis. You have to have a reason for saying that. How do you know that's true? Well, uh, these two column proofs almost always start out with uh, stating what is given to us. So like in this proof, we are given that angle one is congruent to angle two. And they want us to prove that angle two is congruent to angle one. And so this is the logic. These are the logical steps that we take based upon the reasons for doing it are these uh, properties these definitions or postulates or proven theorems that are accepted by people. We're using it to go one step at a time toward our destination uh, of this uh, statement that we want to prove. So this whole thing is called a proof. And because they're two columns, they call them two column proofs. Okay. All right, here we go. So let me give you an example of a two column proof in your textbook. And you'll see that we are given that the measure of angle one, this guy on the left hand side, is equal to the measure of angle three. And they want us to prove that the measure of angle EBA, that's this whole thing here to the, the half and the right, is equal to the measure of angle DBC which is the center and the left-hand side. Now you'll remember from our last section that we did this proof already. We kind of walked through that using this example four. And these same exact steps now we're taking with the explanation and our reasoning and we're putting this same stuff into this uh, two column proof format. So you'll remember that we uh, began by saying that the measure of angle A, oh, sorry, the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three. And how do you know that? How could you say such an outlandish thing? Well, it's given to us right there. It was given to us in the proof that these two, the measure of these two angles is are equal. So that's our reason is the that they are it's given uh, to us. Then the next step 
is that the measure of angle EAB, which one is that? No, I'm sorry, EBA. EBA, that's the guy on the center and the right here, is equal to the measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 2. And you remember our ability to say this statement here is based on, the reason for that, is the addition, the angle addition postulate. And remember that was an axiom, I think. Axiom means something that is just obvious uh, to us. In fact, I forgot to include that. Uh, back on your notes if you would. If you would uh, make sure and write uh, axiom equals postulate, which equals uh, the self-evident. Uh, maybe I should put self-evident truth, huh? So a self-evident truth, that's your definition of a axiom. It's also your definition of postulate. So your axiom and your postulate, these are synonyms of each other. They are two words that mean essentially uh, the same, the same thing. So it is an axiom, this uh, angle addition postulate, that if you have two angles adjacent to each other, then they will form a larger angle whose measure is the sum of the individual uh, angles. Okay. So from there, we remember we substituted instead of the measure of angle three, because the measure of angle three equals the measure of angle one, we can substitute the measure of angle one in for the measure of angle three. And so that's where we get this equation from, through using the substitution property of equality. Our next step is to do what we did for step two uh, here uh, with the left hand side. So this uh, angle on the left and center, the entire angle here on the outside is equal to the sum of its internal uh, angles. So that's where we get this. So the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two is equal to the larger angle. And now you remember what we did in the last uh, section is we notice that these two guys are the same. So therefore we can use the transitive property. We can start at the measure of angle EAB and transit through the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two and equate that to the measure of angle DBC. So that is the transitive property of equality. So you are ready now for uh, number one example for the uh, uh, guided practice uh, number one that you have in the book and that you see is written here in your uh, notes. So again this is a two column proof. Here's your statements on the left and give me the reason. So where do they get this statement from? Here's a small hint right there or there is your your statement. So what's the reason? What's the reason that they can say that statement, and here's the hint right there, just write that word right there, and that is your reason. But then try to figure out, going from step one down to step two, where did they get that from? And what was the basis for them saying such a thing? Okay, and it's going to be one of uh, the things that we've talked, actually we've not talked about that, so maybe I should, it's similar though to um, similar to, to this, the uh, angle addition postulate. And the answer is a segment addition postulate. We had talked about that, I think it was back in uh, section 1.4, that if you have a segment on the left and then a segment on the right, and these are adjacent to each other on the same line, then the length of the whole equals the length or the sum of the, the parts. And that is the segment addition postulate. So you may not have been able to figure that out, out on your own. That's why I did not include it in there because I was thinking that you would be able to, but you can't probably. So let me give it to you. But for number three and number four, uh, write in the reasons uh, there in your notes. Now, this part over on page 105 of your book, I have just taken the little bits of it, the little top part here, and written it in your notes. Didn't have enough space to put to all of it. But it's saying the same thing that we've, we're familiar with. Um, so, so go back, flip over your notes, and look at uh, uh, 2.5. And you'll remember the reflexive property, A equals A. The symmetric property, 
if A equals B, then B equals A. And the transitive property, that if A equals B and B equals C, then we can say we can transit from A through B to C and say that A equals C. Okay? So you can do those same things. Just like you were able to do those three different properties with real numbers and segment length and angle measure, so also you can do that with segments and with angles. So that's what they're saying here. That you can use the reflexive property on uh, segments. That uh, segment AB is congruent to, remember these are shapes, we're talking about segments, these are shapes, so they're not equal but they are congruent to each other. And symmetric, if uh, segment AB is congruent to segment CD, remember when we look at uh, symmetric, think of uh, switching, uh, then we can say, see all, all we've done is just switch those two, then we can say that. And then transitive, if uh, segment AB is congruent to segment CD, and segment CD is congruent to segment EF, we can start at segment AB and transit through segment CD in order to say that segment AB is congruent to segment EF. Okay, so you can do that with shapes, not just segments, but you can also do that with angles. In fact, you can do that with triangles, you can do that with squares, any shapes, doesn't matter. Okay, so these are just adding the fact that we can do this with, uh, with shapes. And you will need to tell me uh, which of the three. So you're going back to the back side of your notes there, or the front of your notes. Is it reflexive or symmetric or transitive property? that is being uh, used to be able to say that segment CD is congruent to segment CD. Which of those three properties is it? And then for this one, which of those three properties is that? Okay, again, I'm, I'm going very quickly through these uh, videos to condense them, but you have power over me. You can back me up and replay it. You can also read the book on your own. So you have the resources. So please take the time. Don't just watch the video and think you understand it. You have to go back and, and exercise your brain. I look forward to seeing you.